Okay, everybody, welcome back. So this is our uh, second video with Michael Pierce on his new book. Um, so, um, Michael, in your book, you talk about this theory of energy flow between the types, between the functions, between the, the letters of the, the types. Can you explain that? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll do my best. I am definitely taking uh, my notions of energy from Jung and also from Freud. And I mean, they kind of, it dribbled down to them from, from even further sources back. Uh, it's the, that notion of libido, um, which Jung talks about, where Jung sort of tried to make it. Um, so Freud has directly associated libido with what he believed was a biological, a purely biological process for all intents and purposes, and linked it directly with sexuality. So that was Freud, who was kind of like the Thales, right? If you know anything about the pre-Socratics, Thales says that the ultimate, that's okay. Um, Thales was ancient Greek philosopher said the ultimate um, substance underlying everything is water. Um, so he linked it to a physical material thing we're already familiar with. And then his follower, Anaximander, who I think Jung is kind of like, goes in and takes that and says, well, it can't be, it, it, it can't be like something that we're already familiar with because that would limit its ability to represent everything. So Jung kind of tries to neutralize it into just psychic energy, just neutral psychic energy from which all of the different manifold psychic things that happen in the mind and in the body and um, uh, everything stems from that. So we, he uh, abstracts it from just sexuality. So um, anyway, that, that, that's sort of a side note. But I'm mentioning that because I am drawing from the notion, um, and it is, it is frankly at times a somewhat a uh, 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 crude or primitive notion still because this is such a young sort of science or area of study in a lot of ways, but it is very helpful to think in terms of, like we had talked about in the last video or, um, excuse me, about um, creativity and how there's like this sense of effort going towards creativity. And that's sort of part of what they're getting at, that there's, it, the best model we have, it seems, is to describe that in terms of uh, subjective energy flowing. And um, so anyway, I, I, it, it helps to think of it in terms of energy because energy flows and it flows in circuits and, and it, it expresses work and it can go in different directions. So um, I'm drawing from that and I um, use that as sort of a rough basis for talking about extroversion and introversion and talking about how it's almost just how my mind tends to think about these things anyway, mm -hmm. is that as soon as you posit one thing, I'm going to start thinking about what the opposite of that thing Interesting. is. Interesting. So you're talking about, this is where you're getting into the, the energy flow. So the, yes. the first part of yes. it is about... Uh, there's introverted and extroverted energy, and then there's a natural change from one to the other, yes. back to the, the first, and then to the second again. Yes, it's a it's a cycle. Um, yes. So when you when you pause at the opposite of the first thing, um, because they are opposites, just my mind will instantly start to blur them together because their opposition actually unites them. Um, and, uh, so they will flow into each other. So with say extroversion, introversion, which kind of is the basis on which everything in the book is built. I, it becomes very, uh, I say it several times, it becomes very binary, almost geometric in a way, because you start with these two principles and then you vary them and you get sets of opposites that sort of stack on each other and you get yeah. a ton of variety from that. Um, but anyway, the um, extroversion, introversion, extroverted is um, uh, in, in Jung, the way Jung talks about it and what the words literally mean is extroverted is an outward turning energy and introversion is an inward turned energy. So it goes out and then in. So you can think of the universe as being the subject, which is Whatever you are, I haven't really figured out what the I actually is, um, mm -hmm. but uh, whatever the ego or self is, 
It is this subjective private sphere. Um, and you can think about the flow of the energy going inwards into there, concentrating, creating new stuff that is separated off from the rest of the world and its laws. And then the extroverted motion is the releasing that out in back into the environment. Um, I will say a caveat though, for those who are, who are more familiar with the book, that um, uh, I will admit, I think I, I got a, a tad bit fuzzy in, in um, some of the extrapolations I drew. So what I specifically mean is I tie universality and um, contextuality into introversion and extroversion. And um, it, it, I, I think I get slightly confused um, to whether universality is, is because I, I relate universality to extroversion, but I just said extroversion is an outward pushing when really the outward pushing is the, more the contextual I related to. Anyway, sorry, maybe <laughs> I, I got a little off topic there, but. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is all very interesting stuff. So first of all, you're talking about this flow from introvert to extrovert, back to introvert to extrovert. You've also yeah. talked about- it, it might be better actually to think more purely of it in terms of out from the subject and then from the world into the subject. Hmm. Um, Jung's original concepts, I think, I think what I was trying to say earlier is, is I, it's not that I've broken with Jung, but I shift my focus a little bit to be much more about object and subject and hmm. the energy flow in the cycle between, between the two uh, as they interact with the, the world around them. Okay, so, so like it's, it's more about the flowing process back yes. and forth and the, the interaction between the two. Yeah. Right. It's kind of like, um, I think I use this metaphor in the book. Um, uh, it's, it's like digestion. Hmm. You, you take matter from the external world and you consume it and then it is assimilated into your body and then you poop it out. <laughs> <laughs> And it, or you vomit it out. Or that, that, a, that, that's, more, definitely, that's definitely that's the less true. elegant way. That's a less elegant way. Or a more elegant way, a more elegant way would be to, to say that you assimilate it, it becomes energy. So actually, this, this is a beautiful way of putting it. The sun is where all of the energy in our food ultimately comes from. It, it's mm -hmm. the ultimate source because it causes the plants to grow. The plants are eaten by animals and they consume the energy. And ultimately, we take that energy in the form of food, um, consume it, and it becomes energy in our bodies, and then we then change the environment um, and eventually become a part of the environment again. Um, yes. From the dust uh, thou art, to dust thou shalt return. So. Wow. And that is, this is showing the connection between everything and the how everything's involved in the transformation process. Yes. So, and you take this to uh, different things. One is um, to sensing intuition, feeling, thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, also this kind of, uh, one of the grand um, overarching themes in the book is about the universal and uh, contextual or, or like the, yes. the, um, the female and male energies involved yes. in typology as well. Okay, so do you want to talk a bit about this? Absolutely. Um, I, I, so, so part of the reason for my focusing on subject and object is because that helps to, to make it a little more clear um, with the, uh, I, I tie into the feminine and masculine archetypes and I try to be very clear about the fact I'm dealing with the archetypes um, because for very good reason, many people are very, myself included actually, which is why I try to be very clear about it, are very touchy about, about people trying to forcefully instantiate those archetypes into reality. So I'll be less abstract. Basically, I'm just saying that I talk about the feminine as this passive energy and the masculine as active energy. So I'm tapping into a long tradition of the archetypal masculine and feminine. <laughs> I'm not talking about um, I'm emphatically not talking about individual men and women, mm -hmm. precisely because individual men and women, as far as I'm concerned, combine both those energies, um, but there, you can argue there's differences between them and how those energies interact with each other mm -hmm. in those people. 
Yeah, and um, you you anyway. also make this really uh, you make this very clear in the book too. So this is about yeah. the the archetypes of uh, masculine and feminine. And it's not about like um, specifically about um, men being masculine or female yes. being feminine yeah. or like uh, the biological difference. So the the bio, bi body is just very symbolic of the archetype. Yes. Yeah. I, I play with, I play with that idea in that third chapter, masculine and f versus feminine, yes. or sorry, feminine versus masculine. Um, because I, I tie them into the energy flow where the feminine is the archetypal feminine is the energy flow from the world imposing onto the body and bringing ideas into the body. So it's related to the, to the passive, to the yin. Um, whereas the yang, I relate to the masculine, which is the um, outward, outward pushing energy from the inside out. And I talk about the notion of the, the feminine is, this is maybe the more controversial notion. I, I talk about, in my view, the feminine, I relate that to um, order, which is not normal. People relate the feminine more to chaos. I relate it to to order partly because I like to be subversive, but also <laughs> I don't like being subversive. What am I talking about? I secretly want to be subversive, um, but it's it's order because it's the city where um, there's this I call it fair mindedness, where you are concerned about other people outside of you, and you they are. Um, uh, you become a no self. You deny the self in order to help these other people and you create linkages and uh, you unite into a city where there are set rules that everybody obeys and so everybody is supposed to chip in. And I quickly relate that to the functions of extroverted feeling, for instance, which ha will um, essentially has this self-negating, though that gets a little muddy in the ENFJ. Um, but extroverted feeling, introverted sensation, extroverted intuition, and introverted thinking, um, which I don't want to get into the function axes right now. That would get too complicated. But whereas the, the masculine, the outward flow is outside the city. So it's fundamentally individualistic because it is the individual having desires, FI or, or NI in terms of visions. It's having that internal fire that is guiding them to posit goals and move towards those goals. Yes. And so you'll get conflict when the hunter, the solitary hunter has to try to live in the city and they steal your property because they want something. <laughs> anyway. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, so this, um, there's the, there's the, first of all, the universal, um, the, the, the feminine mm -hmm. and if, and these are related archetypes, at a symbolic level, right? Yes. And then so we talk about the universal as being fair-minded about about kind of like the about a uh, culture being in a city yeah. and people people um, basically society society having laws and rules and people working within laws and rules to be able to get along to be able yes. to cooperate. Right. Also a language or a logos, I relate to it. The notion that you have logic and rules that sort of frame the energy and guide it. Yeah, so absolutely. Michael, what you remind me of is about, uh, first of all, I remember um, uh, there, there's a YouTuber way back called uh, EJ R&D and he talked about <laughs> introvert feeling as kind of having its own, like each person has, with introvert feeling has their own language in, in a kind of way like yeah and then um what, when it comes to extroverted feelings like they want to make a clear language which people share so that would be like yes. an example of that yes mm -hmm. yeah that that'd be a perfect example um extroverted feeling links into the language of other people in order to unite everybody and be on the same page it wants feelings to be um, uh, 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 it wants the feelings to be external to it. Um, and so everybody kind of gets melted together. Whereas introverted feeling wants to maintain its own individuality and doesn't want to link up 
mm -hmm. with those notions. So you'll get, for instance, a thing you'll see with INFPs, I think, is there will, or ISFPs on the two FI dominant types is, is <laughs> they don't, they don't want to, to, they get frustrated having to play by what they perceive to be very limited rules given them by society as to how they are able to express themselves. Um, so the ISFP will often really struggle with it because they're, they have NI as well. The INFP will, will often find very, from my perspective, odd and creative composite ways um, of, of combining things you wouldn't think yes. to combine or to yes. create their own style and to figure out how to approximate what they're really feeling, mm -hmm. um, which is always has to be separate from um, the, the sort of generalized mm -hmm. feelings of society. Anyway. And, I, and I, that's something I could uh, relate with because I think, um, so you mentioned about like the, the axis of inspired feeling, expert thinking, belonging in, in within the, the contextual, right? Yes. Here. And then, um, so that's about, it's more, it's more of a kind of a personal goal oriented yes. kind of sphere, right? It's goal oriented. It's, um, it's, I call it contextual because that's, that's literally what it is. It always thinks in terms of the context of an individual in a space. And so it always singles in on this point and the world as the perspective that point has. So everything takes on a very specific meaning specifically in terms of what that thing desires or wants to accomplish, what its goal is. Um, you know, the world becomes a, a nail if you have a hammer sort of thing. I, I don't think that's quite the, I don't think that's quite how that phrase goes, but you get the idea. <laughs> so so what, uh, what I wanted to comment there is that I feel like uh, if I was relating to people is through these clever ways and why mm -hmm. it's uh, kind of related to what you mentioned about fair-minded, right? Is I, I'm relating myself by um, respecting, um, perspectives or I'm trying like going yes. around I'm like going around so I'm not like destroying things yes. in, a, in a direct way right yes so it's more of a, of a clever kind of approach but it's a way to kind of uh, symbolically preserve the society yes mm -hmm. yeah the 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 INFP the ISFP while I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily call them destroying or most people wouldn't think of them that way there is a bit of that there, at least in the sense that they're much more of the purely the hunter, the ISFP is, um, where they don't, they just simply have no relations with the society. Whereas the INFP has this admixture where on the one hand, they're very individualistic, but on the other hand, they're trying to figure out how to still express that without smashing other people or treading on their toes, allow them to also become individuals. And so mm -hmm. you get these, um, and there's also just a sense of, um, uh, uh, an example I could use is if you've ever played like an RPG video game, like um, where you'll talk with like a townsfolk person and you'll have like several options of what to say. Mm -hmm. And so with FE, and this isn't always the case if they're like really crappy options, but usually FE will be much more willing to figure out, okay, these are the options given me. So which option approximates best to what I'm trying? What will help me to communicate what I want to? And so usually it'll be more like, well, what's the nicest thing to say okay. in this scenario? Whereas FI will have a much more specific idea of what they want to communicate, but they don't want to be lost in translation. Hmm. And so they'll, they'll constantly be trying to say, well, it's not that, and it's not that, it's something in the middle. Yes. And the INFP will try to combine them or, um, um, or figure out or, um, and I think that can also bleed into sometimes people trying to figure out what their type is. I think, I, I think it's, uh, I maybe actually I'll, I'll, I'll reel back on that because there's, there's a lot of things involved there. But what I was going to say is I'll, I've often seen people who I, I at least think are more NFP types um, who will have a much harder time settling down on a type because they're much more focused. They're not willing to, um, 
to approximate themselves in any way. They, yes. they don't like that. They're like, well, I'm kind of like that, but sometimes I'm also like this and I want to smash them together. And I'm like, no, because <laughs> that's not how I am. I'm, I'm like, no, just you can do that in your spare time, but stop messing with my system. Yeah, so um, what, what I hear is, uh, well, first of all, uh, the INFJ, uh, kind of like the INFP, according to uh, your system, is a, is a mixture of these energies of uh, yeah. the contextual and the universal, the, the fair-minded and also the, the goal-oriented, goal right? Yeah. So what, what we hear, like for you, what you don't want as an INFJ to be lost in translation is your, your perception of... Of, yes. of the world so that that's uh, that's done more directly the communication of it um through extra feeling and also creating a system by which um people could follow for that mm -hmm. that is the fair-minded approach it's, that's for that's how um you are or infjs in general are willing to uh, compromise right so that's the yes so, so our types would be opposites in what we uh, what we compromise on or what we won't, yes. we won't uh, sacrifice for uh, for to be to avoid being lost in translation. 